questions and comments, how about a show of hands? Uh, raise your hand if you are opposed to a U.S. military strike on Syria. Raise your hand if you are in favor of it. Raise your hand if you don't know. This, you know, we think this is the chorus, we're preaching to the chorus. This is the country, this is what the country looks like. Uh, this is a, a, a representative sampling. We are the majority, uh, and it's that strong. Uh, we just aren't all actively, strategically pushing it on our so-called representatives uh, in Washington, D.C. So that's the job. Uh, anyone with a question or a comment or a, yeah? I just want to um, make sure everyone in the room knows where Pope Francis stands on this situation. And on Sunday, the Pope um, called for a day of fasting and prayer for people of all faiths on Saturday the 7th. Saturday the 7th, he's going to be publicly at St. Peter's from 6 p.m. until midnight Italian time. So for us in the afternoon, if we, if we choose to, um, the, the first peoples of this country, the Native Americans, say there's nothing more potent than a, than a heartfelt prayer. So I'm inviting you all to use thought, your thought power, your soul force, or your prayers, and fasting, and join with the Pope on Sunday. At 6 p.m. Italian Saturday, time Saturday. is Saturday, this coming Saturday, 6 p.m. Italian time is noon our time, and there is a rally at the White House at that moment. No food allowed. You can fast <laughs> and rally. Uh, but we've got the Pope and Rush Limbaugh on our side. You know, we have got, we have got a serious majority. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to point out that, in fact, as a lot of my Israeli friends have pointed out, that there is, in fact, a lot of the same level of uh, concern about this action because of the powder keg that it would ignite of uh, division in Syria and in Palestine as well. So, I want to speak to that. I guess my question is, um, of course, from McCain and Obama on the same side, it's hard for me to really deal with that. <laughs> I, I do think that McCain seemed to be a warmonger, but he spent, I believe, five years in prison. And I often think about how did he come out of prison spending five years better than I did when I spent only five days in American jail. So he must have got pretty good treatment over there. Uh, and I think he ought to be one of the people who are really for this. But my question is this. It seems that it is inevitable that there's going to be some kind of military confrontation in this. I do think that it's good that we are doing the kind of things that you're doing. But my question is then, do you feel that it's any way to prevent military action from taking place in the next same month? Well, I want to speak to that. Does anybody else? That's what we're here for. Well, look, we, if you believed it was hopeless, if you believed there was no chance, if you believed there was no point and it inevitably was going to happen, you wouldn't be here. I mean, people, people who believe that stayed home tonight. Uh, and of course there is the possibility. They do not have the votes in the House. They don't have them. Uh, they, they have... Republicans more than Democrats, but Congress members by the dozens today and yesterday lining up against uh, this, including a significant number of Congress members on the House Foreign Affairs Committee that sat through this ridiculous pitch from John Kerry and Chuck Hagel today. Uh, they don't have the votes. And so what happens if the Speaker then doesn't call a vote? And after all of this lobbying by Congress members to get to hold a vote, and all of this show from the White House that they want to abide by the Constitution, never mind that the UN Charter is part of the Constitution, uh, and then they don't have the vote, what if a congressman from Virginia somewhere maybe gets the nerve to put in a discharge petition, where it's, which is where you get a majority of Congress members to sign a piece of paper that says, we want to have a vote, and the Speaker can go to hell. Then, 
then you have the House of Representatives vote. Or you have them denied the vote and they don't do the discharge petition, but they're outraged and the public is outraged. Uh, then you have a rally at the White House ten times the size of the one we're going to have this Saturday. Then you have a movement that begins to change things. And, you know, I know, I know, Uriah, that you know very well what, what things movements can change. And, and we've been talking about some of them uh, tonight. But the government in Washington is very, very good at pretending not to be impacted, pretending to ignore us, pretending not to, not to feel our, our activism. But you, you read the memoirs of any official, including George W. Bush, and they were being paid close attention, and they were responding to the public's demands even while pretending not to. I mean, this is, this is their concept of democracy. They pr pretend to disrespect it. They, they, they open a hearing with, with Kerry and Hagel by announcing that polls should be ignored. Uh, and, you know, we should bomb. There's a book by uh, Boston University Professor Franken called Peace to End All Peace, which describes the, the European colonial restructuring of the Middle East after the end of World War I, um, where it set up a whole range of monetarian controlled countries across um, the region. And we are currently experiencing um, a, what I call post post colonial phase. I'm moving to answer his question, where the post the after colonialism fell, mostly in the early 60s, either monarchs or military dictatorships ruled much of the Middle East. Those monarchies and military dictatorships are slowly falling. The people of the region of the Middle East, outside of Israel, have not, and maybe Turkey, have not had the democratic opportunity for self-governance for centuries. They've not had the capacity to exercise what that means, to manage political conflict creatively toward uh, joint and productive processes. So most of these countries have been set up to disintegrate without uh, the veneer of political control that monarchies or military dictatorships have, have provided for the last four decades. The challenge now in most of the countries around Syria is that, that each of those are unstable on their own terms. And if Syria goes, it will catalyze divisions in Lebanon between uh, Hezbollah and the, and, and the Sunnis. It will catalyze divisions in Turkey um, between the significant Alawite community there, the Kurds in the east. Um, it will catalyze oh, the, the chaos in Iraq is still going. Jordan has a significant Muslim Brotherhood um, um, group that is currently debating what its stance should be um, politically and being repressed by the government. Um, Egypt is, we saw, I won't go into what happened in Egypt. So almost, and Tunisia is rocking right now, Libya is chaos. Almost every country in the region has the potential to disintegrate even further if Syria were destabilized. And I don't want to say that lightly. Um, Syria is the battleground for a global jihadist vision. It's also the battleground in between um, Chinese and Russian vision of decreasing Western control of the Middle East and the West's vision that it still controls it. Uh, witness France is very willing uh, engagement with a potential attack. My, my problem with an attack on Syria is it introduces a level of instability at a time when the region doesn't need any more instability. And there, according to one blog I read today, there are, there's, there's intense debate in Israel over whether this is wise or not, which, which lines up across the political divide there in reference to, reference to that, that community. If you want to read some very significant critique of the intelligence and te uh, assessments, you can read Patrick Lang's blog for the last four days a former military intelligence Middle Eastern uh, specialist who's written intelligence briefs for the highest levels of the government. He links to a whole range of significant critiques. I won't go into the details of, them, of those, of the intelligence briefs that have been used to justify the attack. My problem with escalating conflict by direct U.S. involvement is I don't know what the end game is. 
and I don't know what the short-term benefit would be other than loosening the control over the, the largest stockpile of chemical weapons in the Middle East. I, I don't even want to think what that means, given that about six months ago, Turkish intelligence took down an Al-Qaeda cell in Turkey that had two, two pounds of set weaponized sarin gas. Um, that Al-Qaeda has already gotten a hold of wep uh, weaponized sarin gas for potential use outside of the Middle East. And if you, if you lose up, up the controls of that, that much chemical weaponry in that unstable region, I don't even want to think of what that means. So my, my personal preference, no, I won't go there, that's enough. Okay, we have a question over here. So, uh, one point is that to harvest all of this tonight is really, really vital. So I see this is being recorded, I'm recording on my phone. Are we going to be able to send this on to everybody that we know so that everyone has access to, to this level of information that we've, that we've been privileged to access here. Well, the, the video of this event, barring uh, disasters, will at least be on davidswanson.org this evening and warisacrime.org this evening and okay. lots of other websites. Uh, and you can go to davidswanson.org and sign up for emails to find out about future events like this one unless you've already signed the clipboard that's going around. Okay, um, so we can send that all that link on to people. I'm just thinking this is amazing to have this this condensed kind of information and then from it even the condensed two points that you want us to convey uh, uh, the, to our that, that one of which is what we don't want our our politicians to vote for and one of which is what we do want them to work for the negotiations and that's really vital because I think a lot of people don't I mean they, they don't know that there's an alternative and that's what we're trying to uh, uh, help people understand and then following the these comments here makes me wonder even more, are we looking at our politicians as being really, or the, even the intelligence people as being not very intelligent? Are we looking at something more insidious underlying this dynamic? <laughs> Because they actually don't. 
you know, in terms of the amount of international support they have, it's pathetic. I mean, it's not just London that they lost. Italy? <laughs> well, they lost many, many countries around the world, including Russia and China, which, you know, essentially gave them support in the, in the invasion of, of uh, Iraq. Iran gave them support in the invasion of, of Iraq. A lot of countries kind of either signed off or gave a nod and a wink. Now, most of those countries are saying, don't do it again. So our president is right now at the G20 meeting. What a blessing that he is there and that there is a G20 now because the G20 is this organization that is not just, you know, the rich and comfortable countries, that is, you know, the United States, Japan and all the rich European countries. The G20 includes South Africa, it includes Russia, it includes China, it includes Brazil, it includes Turkey, I think Saudi Arabia, but he's going to be hearing from a lot broader of an international audience than he is used to hearing. And I think we should also be following that politics at the same time that we're following the politics in Washington, D.C., and building those international bridges as much as we can in the peace movement here. Let me just add on this question of are they stupid or are, do they mean ill. Uh, there is no question that the President and the Secretary of State and others are lying to us. Uh, whether or whether they might happen to be right about who launched chemical weapons attacks or not, uh, they have clearly lied about how long it took the Syrian government to allow inspectors in. If you read the, the text of the White House's uh, uh, dossier. Uh, it, it is, I mean, I, I think the word for how it's written is sleazy. I, I mean, it just attempts to suggest more certainty and more knowledge uh, than it actually claims if you, if you read it with a little bit of care. And Gareth Porter is a reporter who's gone through every word and done that uh, annotation very well. Um, so there's, there's no question that they are trying to claim to know things with greater certainty and in greater detail than they do. Uh, but they haven't even shown us the level of evidence that Colin Powell gave us before, before the war in Iraq. I mean, show us the evidence. Right. They keep talking about all this stuff. Oh, we have intercepts. Oh, we have, you know, blood samples. Oh, we have... Nobody's seen it. Right, there's no, no names, no they sources, treat, They no treat us with contempt. Videos, no recordings, no nothing. I mean, they finally have risen to the level of bothering to lie to Congress, the George W. Bush level of, of performance, right? And liberals were just thrilled when, you know, Obama reached that level. But they, they aren't even performing at Colin Powell standards. Uh, and so we, we, it's, it's very, very healthy that people are not taking this seriously. And if, the, and if the outcome is to conclude, well, you just can't have a good investigation during a war, well, that's one more good reason to stop the war. Oh, sorry, you were next. Can I add one more thing? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think it's absolutely important that we question the evidence that they're presenting and, and, and do exactly as David just mentioned. But to a certain extent, it sort of plays into their hand. Uh, yes. Because if they end up being able to prove without a shadow of a doubt mm -hmm. that it was in fact the Syrian regime that used these chemical weapons, they're going to hold that up as, okay, now we have justification to go to war. And I don't think we should allow them to draw that line and use that as the trigger point. Because Lord knows uh, this is hardly the first time in even re recent history that nations have used chemical weapons against their own people or against civilians in other countries. Unfortunately, the majority of times it's happened in recent history is done either in our name or with our tacit support. So it's, it's very uh, problematic for the United States to stand up and say, uh, because they used or allegedly used chemical weapons, we have the right now to go to war, to launch an attack. I think that's uh, a false Well, the intelligence I was talking about, though, was don't, don't the intelligence people get back to these decision makers and say, this whole region is going to be destabilized by this area? That was what the intelligence was. Some of them are risking Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning's status to, to say that, to put their voices in the media, uh, their doubts. And, and Dave, you weren't here, but that was sort of my main point oh, uh, before you got here. I completely agree. Okay, we have